just chat with you a little bit. Sure. No problem, man. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to start, I mean, obviously, you know, there's so much we can get into with your career, but pretty much just mainly focus on that BG stuff. When the job opened up and, you know, you saw the opportunity, I'd say first, what drew you to BG? And second, was there some hesitation in your mind considering the state of the program or did that not factor too much into your desire for the job? Well, I was involved in two other Mac jobs, um, uh, whenever the uh the bowling green uh approached me with the with the job opportunity and um i just felt that um that bowling green had such a rich tradition and i knew exactly where the program was and uh, they were going to give me time to rebuild it the proper way and you know i think location wise bg's perfect you know in terms of we're two hours from Cleveland. We're 55 minutes from Detroit. You're two hours and 30 minutes from Cincinnati. You're two hours to Columbus. I just think that we sit uh, in a in a, a rich, heavy, um, awesome uh, recruiting base. And I just think that uh, there was just a ton of, of, of things that attracted me to the job. You know, the tradition, the location, and then obviously uh, – I had no idea about the academics, no idea about the town, but uh, I married my wife, who was a two-time BG grad. She got her undergrad in chemistry and her master's in chemistry. And I also wanted to go to a place that wasn't a commuter school. I wanted to go to a place that there's 20,000 uh, students on campus. And I just think that's very attractive to a kid uh, in the Mid-American Conference that can that can go to a place that... Uh, has a great, you know, college atmosphere. And uh, so there was a lot of things that, uh, that I felt that BG had that, uh, and that, that really attracted uh, us to the job. So we knew that uh, walking into it was, uh, was going to be a struggle for a while. We, we knew that it was going to be a full four years to, uh, to be competitive again. And, um, you know, that they gave me the opportunity and, and it was discussed right off the get go. I go, oh, the only way that I'll take this job is that I, if I'm guaranteed five years to to build it the right way. And if they were looking to go down completely the JC model and all that, I wouldn't have taken the job. You know, I, I just I wanted to try to build something that uh, had the ability to sustain. Right. And you t just touched on it. And I think it's a big credit to obviously you um, also. Bob Mosberger at the time, Rodney Rogers, the other power brokers, because you mentioned it from the get that this was going to be a complete tear down to the studs. It's not going to be an overnight fix. And when you were going into those interviews, was there a part of you that was thinking, maybe I should try to jazz this up a little bit? Or I figure that's just not you. You're going to tell them how it is. And so was there a part of you that thought they could possibly go another direction because someone else is going to try to sell the dream of a an overnight turnaround? No, I was very direct with it, and they were very direct with me. To be honest with you, they they knew that uh, that it was a uh, going to be a tough road. Um, I just think that we all agreed that uh, we were going to do it the right way. We were going to build it back with um, four hour radius kids. I really honestly believe in year three, uh, if we would have went down hardcore the transfer portal, uh, we could have probably been very similar to what we were this year. Uh, but it just wasn't the right time. We needed to get another class of high school kids in here to build some type of foundation in some type of tradition uh, that they've had here. So, you know, we knew year, years one and two were going to be what they were going to be. Uh, year three as a staff, very similar to what Clawson did. You know, you had to make a decision, OK, are you going to try to fix this right now or are you going to try to set this thing up for the long haul? And that's what we did year three. We knew uh, that we uh, made a decision to to uh, bring in a bunch of high school kids. And uh, and then in year four, obviously, we went down the transfer portal because we were ready to do it. So um, that's been the philosophy behind it. Uh, it's been Dave Clawson's model from the get. You know, he said exactly how it's been. He said, year one, you're going to suck. Year two, you're going to suck even worse. <laughs> year three... Uh, you're going to win about four to five games. You might see some light at the end of the tunnel. And year four, you're going to be really competitive. And 
his model would have fell completely the way that he said it uh, if we wouldn't have lost all these kids to, you know, to, that were starters to the transfer portal. Uh, we lost quite a bit, but we've got enough foundation that uh, we just got to replace them now, you know, in this in this next upcoming free agent market that's going to be here beginning on April 15th. Yeah, and I definitely want to touch more on the transfer portal, but going back to when you initially take the job, how tough is it to walk into a room of roughly 100 kids that you didn't recruit and came from another staff and to sell them on your vision? Or I know you were quoted once saying the country club mentality is over. So how tough is it? And I, I think part of it in your hiring of a staff was very veteran. And was that all to really push that like the old way is done? Like the slipping of the academics, the off the field issues, that's over. Is that how tough is that to put into a, a room of like a hundred kids? Well, um, it was interesting in hindsight, whenever you look back at it, you know, the best thing that we ever did was hire a veteran staff, a staff that came from uh, very good programs. And, uh, you know, obviously our culture, you know, starts from the, from the top down and, uh, you know, those guys were really able to uh, to translate my message to uh, their individual position groups. And, uh, you know, we had to make changes. We had to move people on. That was very difficult. You know, I'm not a guy that wants to throw anyone out the door. But, uh, you know, we were in a position that, uh, you know, guys made uh, mistakes and we had to move on and rebuild, you know, from the ground up. So uh, to answer your question, it was uh, very challenging. Uh, I knew walking into the door that it was going to be hard, uh, but I didn't know that it was going to be this hard, to be quite honest with you. I remember the first month closing my door and I go, what did I just do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's taught me a ton in terms of, uh, I've, I've been at Cadillac jobs. Uh, I started at a Cadillac job, Michigan, uh, Florida. Um, and then really at the later half of my career, I've been in a rebuild mode at Virginia tech. When we took it over, it was completely a rebuild mode on offense. And we recruited seven NFL players and gave ourselves a chance. If we, if Michael Brewer doesn't get hurt, we win the championship hands down against, or we play against Clemson, I should say, um, Boston college was the same deal. Uh, it was a total rebuild on offense. And the next thing you know, we're playing for Clemson on our side and then I get this job. So yeah. I've been, I've been very familiar and uh, with how to rebuild, how to rebuild culture. Um, you know, you take a ton of crap at the beginning and uh, for not winning enough games and all that, but you got to be able to hang in there and you got to be able to do that. You know, these quick fixes, they don't sustain anything. Uh, they just don't. And uh, I, I never wanted to use Bowling Green uh, and, and try to quick fix it and move on. I, I, that's not my style. I want to build this thing and be able to win a championship and, uh, eventually either stay or hand it to someone and they can continue it. But, uh, I just didn't want to, uh, use Bowling Green whatsoever. I wanted to make sure that, uh, we're building this thing the right way. Yeah. And I commend you a lot for that. Um, cause I, you know, I, I saw when you took the job and I kind of consider myself a bit of a college football junkie. So I understand, like, you know, if you go take a job like Boise State in the Mountain West, you start at the top. That's getting in the Cadillac. Just don't crash it. You out recruit everyone. You outspend everyone. But and you, it's not even just taking a Mac job, which already has parity. It's taking it over because the previous guy was fired and changes need to be made. So the first season you go three and nine but you beat Toledo. Uh, can you talk about that game? Obviously, I know you've talked about it a ton. And also, I want to touch on your relationship, only having two quarterbacks in the room, because obviously Matt's transfer somehow got denied. And so you only had Darius and Grant Lloyd. So what was your relationship like with those two? And then how was that team able to somehow beat Toledo, who was 30-point favorites? Yeah, we, we made an emphasis from the time that we got all hired. You know, our first staff meeting, um, we talked about how we were going to rebuild the program and uh, also our complete emphasis is Toledo. You know, that is a, uh, a very good program. Uh, they, they've won a lot of games, and this is a, you know, a huge rivalry. I mean, unbelievable rivalry. It's, it's uh, 
you know, one of the best rivalries I think that I've been a part of. And um, we just made it an emphasis. And, uh, you know, we had a decent week of practice, um, probably one of our better weeks that first year. And uh, you knew uh, leaving the uh, the hotel that we were going to beat Toledo. I mean, there was no question about it. And I think it was, number one, the emphasis was every single day. Uh, number two, uh, being able to to get the, those kids' mind and believe that they can win, you know, a, a game where we were 30-point underdogs. And uh, they went out and they played really well and uh, probably the best they've ever played and uh, found a way to win that game. I thought Grant Lloyd played uh, out of his mind, and our defense and special teams did a great job that day. Yeah, I mean, it was. I was at the game. That was my senior year. I remember storming the field. Really the only bright spot I got to have in my four years of Bowling Green football-wise. And obviously doing something, you know, the past decade, even winning MAC championships, couldn't beat Toledo. So when you guys won that game, I was fully bought in on your vision, everything you were selling. Because I was like, that's the mark of a good staff. You know, you, you know you're not going to win a lot of games that first year, but you take down a rival for the first time in a decade and just really put a little bit of proof of concept there for the kids. But then you move into 2020, and obviously that year was globally a disaster, uh, given the COVID and only playing five games. Um, but also, and, and I felt like I – part of the reason I started tweeting in 2020 was I was like, I need to be the flag bearer for people understanding that Bowling Green is going to be terrible this year. And it's no one's fault, except the fact that you're basically fielding an FCS roster. When you look at the scholarships and the fact that over the previous 75 scholarships from the previous staff, only about 30 kids, I think were left if my memory serves me correct. And yeah. so, and that's also when I told my brother who went to Bowling Green with me, we're both diehard fans that Matt McDonald's my favorite player ever because who wants to sign up to just go out there and get their butt kicked physically, just take a million hits every week. So can you talk about kind of what you saw from Matt in a year where from an outsider's perspective, maybe didn't see a lot and just kind of about the frustrations of that year? Well, you know, Matt uh, tries to get eligible and uh, he was – one of the few that didn't, you know, it was the very, very end. I think his waiver was one of the last quarterback waivers that year that everyone got uh, eligible. And uh, I think the NCAA was tired of of granting all these eligibility deals. And we used Tom Mars, who's excellent at uh, what he does, and uh, they denied him. So he had to sit and watch, you know, for a year. And uh, then COVID strikes. And our business model then completely had to change uh, across the board. And uh, we changed it. It was the day before uh, uh, we went on spring break that uh, literally, thank goodness, it occurred then because I spent all week literally redividing. It was it was 22 hours worth of, of work every day. Just uh, how can we do this and improve a program that uh, – you know, that was still down in the dumps. And, um, you know, looking back, and there's some things that uh, um, that I've really learned in terms of recruiting. I thought, uh, you know, we I'll never, ever call a recruit ever again. I'm going to FaceTime with him all the time. So there were some things that we learned from there. And then when you get into the season, um, we, we they, they end up saying that uh, – <laughs> We we're a day away from starting training camp, and then they 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 back it up, and then they cancel the season, and then uh, you know roughly, and I, I I forget maybe end of September they say we're going to play six game season, and uh, you know we knew, uh, you know number one we weren't able to train the proper way all summer long because of of COVID, and. Uh, you know, we knew that those six weeks were going to be some long, hard six weeks and then putting on top of it COVID and putting on top of it all the testing and put on top of it. Uh, there was guys that would be completely uh, uh, not practicing, you know, for a couple of weeks because they did test positive. So it was a complete disaster in every aspect. Nothing that you would ever want a second year program that was on a rebuild to be a part of. But the positive that came out of it is that we played a bunch of young guys 
And uh, we got to, they got to experience getting their asses kicked, to be quite honest with you, and what it was going to take uh, in the next couple of years to, to put themselves in position uh, to be competitive. And uh, so we get through that. And then uh, we made a decision as a staff in that third year that we were still going down the high school route. We, we took a couple of transfers, but we took primarily all high school kids. And the, and the rationale was, is that we needed another class uh, to get our locker room moving in the right direction. Um, we needed a, some, we need, we needed people to be in that locker room and, and want to be at Bowling Green and wanted to play for Bowling Green and ha- wanted to have pride about their school. And we needed another class to do that. And uh, we could have went down the transfer portal path and probably just like I said, been very similar to what we were in year four. Um, but we made that decision for the longevity of the program. But uh, in terms of Matt, um, Matt McDonald took an ass kicking that COVID year. And, and, and that's not even an understatement. I mean, he got his brains knocked in. Yeah. And um, the third year wasn't much better. You know, we were still, um, we were still uh, young at the offensive line position and he really got himself into some bad habits because of getting his brains knocked in. And, um, uh, not too many guys can rewire themselves the way he did. You know, I've, 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 I'm not going to mention these guys' names, but I watched young quarterbacks go in there and get their brains knocked in their first two years, and they they can never recover. And uh, this guy recovered, and uh, we were able to get some more weapons around him. We were able to get our offensive line better, not anywhere where, near where, we, where we wanted it, but it was better. And he went out and competed his ass off and was the second-best passer in the league last year. And uh, – He's a great leader. He's tough as hell. Uh, I wish we could have had him back for this year, to be quite honest with you. I, if we would have had him back uh, this year, uh, there's no question I know where we were going. But uh, he decided that uh, he didn't want to be a seventh-year senior. So <laughs> I get it, you know. So yeah, I get it completely. So, But uh, my relationship with him is uh, is is just like those other nine quarterbacks that I've had that played in the NFL. Um very very tight and uh i'm very uh uh gracious to what he did and how he helped us and how he was mentally tough enough to hang in there uh whenever we were we really sucked and then obviously in year three still not good enough so um my hat's off to him and i'm uh, i'm i'm in, indebted to his uh loyalty and his toughness and uh being able to handle a lot of adversity yeah, no, I totally agree. And kind of moving through the chronological order, 2020, obviously, like you laid out perfectly. And then you said it three years ago, but you were like, year three, we can beat anyone, we can lose to anyone. And that proved to be true again. Um, and so, you know, Matt's first FBS win against Minnesota on the road, absolute stunner. Uh, so was there something you saw in the prep that week that was like, all right, we can exploit this. Our defense is going to be able to do this because they just beat Colorado like by 40 the week before we'd lost a heartbreaker to South Alabama, I think was the week before that. If my memory serves me correct. Um, yeah, so, yep. yeah. So what did you see? And, and did that close loss to South Al kind of light a fire in the locker room a little bit and you know, get into that game? Well, just like you said, you know, I, I really honestly believed we could beat anyone and lose to anyone. And uh, when you watched Minnesota, uh, when we were game prepping for them, we thought defensively uh, that we matched up quite well against them, to be honest with you. We felt uh, up front that we could can control the line of scrimmage. We thought uh, that we had enough depth and uh, enough talent in the back end to hold up against the pass. And uh, we were going to stop the run. We were going to force them to throw the football. And uh, we stopped the run, forced them to throw the ball, and it fell uh, right into our hands in terms of uh, defensively. Offensively, we didn't think that we could run it uh, one yard, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. And, and, and all year long, that's the way we felt. I mean, we didn't, just didn't feel like we could run the ball worth a damn. And uh, – so we 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 really studied the empty packages, the spread out packages. We thought that uh, our receivers matched up well against their linebackers, 
in their uh, their back end. We we thought that uh, up front uh, we couldn't run the ball, and what we had to do is we had to have a lot of controlled passes that we could get the ball out of Matt's hand to be able to function. And uh, but we felt that we could move the football through the air, and uh, we started out throwing the ball and uh, ended up putting ourselves in position. I thought uh, when we hit Broden on the shallow cross when we ran a. Uh, uh, um, uh, gosh, we checked to some type of mesh play and we, we threw Broden the shallow cross and he goes down to the two yard line. I'm going, we're going to beat Minnesota. And then he fumbles the ball. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, so it was, uh, it was, a unbelievable game. And, uh, but it was really weird. It's very similar to the, to the Toledo, uh, when in year one, you just, there was something about when we, when we left the hotel, everyone's like, we're going to beat Minnesota. And um, we we played really well that game for for a young football team. Yeah, I mean, starting two walk on underclassmen on the offensive line is usually a recipe for not being able to run the ball too effectively. And I remember in your post game presser, you know, because you beat a team like Minnesota, and everyone starts putting a huge expectation. And if you've studied the MAC, and I've done a little bit of the research to look it up, very consistently, the do MAC teams beat a Power Five team and then not performing the Mac and a team that wins the entire conference got the doors blown off them by a big team. And you said, listen, we're still young. We still can lose to anyone. And so I think it was just two weeks later, you know, Akron's able to topple us. So it, it turned out to be true. And obviously when I think we were one of the five youngest teams that year. So is that kind of where some of the inconsistency comes? Cause then you have a game like the Buffalo game, which also I think you became the first coach in FBS history to get ejected with that rule um so I did is, yeah so can you tell me about I guess is it the youth that causes those inconsistencies and then moving to the Buffalo game what's it like as a coach obviously you have to be the CEO of the team and you're very hands-on with the offense too how do you then feel when you're forced to watch the game from the production trailer for the back half well the 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 first part is um uh, you're exactly right. We knew we were way too young to win uh, in year three. And uh, that was the discussions and why we went back and forth as a staff um, to either um, take transfers now or stay with the high school model. And um, we felt that for year four and five to be successful, we had to do the high school model. So we knew what we were getting into. And um, we knew that there would be inconsistencies everywhere. We knew that there, we would show some, some uh, moments of uh, greatness. And we knew that we would show a lot of moments of still not there yet, just because of how young we were and still not ready to win. But um, we, uh, we, did, we had some moments that, you know, just very similar to Clawson. Year three, you're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And at times uh, we did. Um, so we just knew that uh, the inconsistencies were going to be there because of youth. And, and it was. And uh, we felt then walking into year four, exactly what we said that we were going to be. We're going to be super competitive. We're going to go to a bowl game. And uh, we did all those things. Um, I think that team with a little bit, uh, a little bit more leadership in a couple areas, you know, losing the uh the seven overtime game you you want that one back for sure you want that one back that's one that uh that we would love to have back and then and the most the two dis most disappointing games of the season uh by far were buffalo and kent and i can't put my finger on it um the majority i would say all but those two games our guys played with extreme emotion had um energy on the sidelines and for some reason we just did not and uh, as a coach you know it's my responsibility for every game for our guys to have energy and juice and go out there and lay it on the line and we just didn't in those two games um, and uh, you know those those two games right now are, are we 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 in the off season are really pointing to okay we put ourselves in position to win almost every single ball game uh, last year except those two just were 
were complete disasters because we didn't come with with great energy and great juice and intensity the way that we approached almost every single game last year. So uh, those were some lessons that uh, that we needed to still learn. And, um, you know, um, the whole plan is next year yet, yet you, that you never have a letdown game the way that we, we had those two. Those two were really disappointing in my mind. Right. Yeah, and I definitely want to dive into 2022, but can you talk at all about getting ejected from the Buffalo game? Like, oh, I don't yeah. even – they, like, cut from – they were at an ad break, and then they cut back to the TV feed, and they're like, well, Scott Leffler's gone. And I'm like, well, I don't know what happened. Like, Well, it was uh, – it was uh, as odd as odd can be. Um, most of the time uh, – um, let's just put it this way. Uh, there was, uh, there was nothing said that, uh, that warranted any of that, to be quite honest with you. Um, I stepped out of the box. The first flag was for me stepping out of the box, uh, discussing that there was a, there was a holding, I thought there was a holding call. So I was thrown a flag on that. They go to a break. The head official I'm very close with, uh, extremely close with. And uh, we were talking about the situation and then there was a discussion with the official that threw the first flag and he threw the second flag on me while we were on break. And yeah. uh, the head the head official goes to me and goes, Scott, that's your second flag. You've got to go. And I go, go where? I mean, I had and I go pick up the, you, you. I go, you heard the whole conversation. This is not a deal where. um, um it was belligerent and off the charts and all the other stuff. I mean, heck, I've said way worse to to officials, way, way worse than than those two flags. And uh, so they threw the second flag and they go, they finally said, Scott, you, you've got to go. You're ejected. And I went, are you are you kidding me? And I go, well, if I'm going to get thrown out, I'm going to make this well worth it. And I, and I did it completely to rally our team. I went bonkers and yeah. I had, it had nothing to do with the officials whatsoever. I, uh, you know, at the end of the day, whenever, whenever uh, we got back and, and had discussions with the Mac and all that, it was a great learning experience for everyone. There was mistakes made on both sides. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, it, uh, you know, it was a, one of those learning situations. But whenever I got the second flag, I was not mad at all. And it, it, it wasn't like a fierce fight between the officials. But once I realized that I was officially gone, I made it a clown show just to, to rally our team. And uh, they uh, they responded. Yeah, and I thought the response spoke a lot to kind of the culture that was really setting in in year three. You know, without the head guy, there still – I mean, it got real physical after you rejected on the field. Um, obviously, Matt capped it off with the fake knee touchdown run, which I loved. Put a little salt in the Buffalo's wound, and then also that finale. Two, you know, three and nine or three and eight teams uh, going at it against Ohio for you guys to just go out there and pretty much dominate them and win that finale. To as for really playing for nothing except to build momentum, keep building the culture, get a win for the guys. I thought that spoke a lot about the team and using that to springboard into 2022. Um, and also it says the meeting's going to end because I don't pay for Zoom. Um, if it cuts, can I just send you another invite so we can finish? Yeah, sure. Sure, no Appreciate problem. That. Yeah, I'll just send it to you when it cuts. Um, but going into 2022, you said all along, you know, when you took the job, that's the bowl year. We're going to be competitive. We're going to fight for the division championship, which you did pretty much playing for it in the last week. But how – does this team and how did you guys in the locker room respond from that seven overtime win to not just beat Marshall, who's a good Sunbelt team, but a team that went on the road to a top 10 ranked Notre Dame, stuffed the ball down their throat for 60 minutes. Um, so what, what does that say about the culture? What do you say to the team when you're prepping for that? And, and how did you just shove it in the face of every idiot like me who thought the season was over after the FCS loss? And, and how did you guys just pull off an absolute stunner? Well, the the uh, the beginning of the season season was a perfect storm. We had to go out to UCLA, which was hands down. And I've coached in the SEC and all that. I have no idea. It was a fluke. 
that was the hottest football game that I've ever been a part of. And yeah, I was there. It was miserable. I hated it. It was miserable. Uh, and we uh, we fly back. We get back at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, and had to start beginning the prep for, uh, for our next game. And, uh, you know, we get into this uh, seven overtime game and uh, we 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 ended up losing the ball game. And I walked into the locker room and uh, I knew that we lost that football game from the week prior. Uh, no doubt about it. I mean, our guys were shot. Um, they were shot during practice uh, for that game. And um, if you study, we won the we won the daily double and I've never. I've never not won the daily double and lost a football game ever. We, we won the explosion battle. We won the turnover battle and we lost the game. It's the first time in my career that we've ever lost the daily double and lost the game or excuse me, won the daily double and lost the game. Uh, we won the explosion battle, won the turnover battle. And I said to our team, I go, listen, you know, we fought our, our tails off. That was a fluke. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we have to learn from our mistakes and we're going to we're going to bounce back the following week. And lo and behold, Marshall beats the dog out of Notre Dame. And, uh, you know, we started the game. And I tell you, when when Marshall got off the bus, uh, there is a pretty looking football team as they get and they can run. Yeah. And um, and they started hot. I mean, they went up 14 nothing in 90 seconds. They went up 14 nothing. We didn't get our first first down until the second quarter. Yeah. And then we settled into the game. And uh, I thought we had a tremendous game plan for the Marshall game, like tremendous. Uh, we knew that we were going to take shots against them. We get the ball uh, down and uh, we get to fourth and uh, a yard. And we come off and fake the duo play and, and hit Kroom on, uh, on, on the slip route. And uh, I think our guys just really played with tremendous emotion. Uh, tremendous intensity and we're able to bounce back and that was a hell of a win it was a great uh, homecoming win and um, you know I knew that our team was a pretty had some character about them because of how this thing started everyone was saying that I should be fired everyone else said these guys suck I mean you know you name it when we lost uh, those first two ball games uh, the storm uh, outside our building was pretty was pretty rocking and rolling, uh, yeah. but our guys, you know, we'd been there before and they were able to uh, stay together and found a way to win a big football game at home against Marshall. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of become your calling card to get up and bite somebody every year. I mean, I had a guy um, who actually works for a big uh, media company is big in the recruiting game. He actually DM me on Twitter. Cause he was like, Hey, I want to talk like some Bowling Green football what do you think about this Marshall game? Cause he's a, a sports better. And I was like, every year coach Leffler seems to get somebody that no one in the world, except him and everybody in that building thinks that they can get. Um, so yeah, it really, really was a great win. And I thought it was the turning point of the season because going in, seeing how tough the non-con schedule was getting just that one win uh, obviously was crucial to going bowling. And then when you start Mac play, and again, when this timer cuts out, I'll just email you another invite right away, if you don't mind. Um, yep. And so, and you talked about it a, a couple minutes ago. You, the Buffalo, so you win the MAC opener against Akron. You get the doors blown off you by Buffalo. And then what did, have you still been able to put your finger on how come we played a relevant game at home? There was no intensity. And then did you salt, like, because something was salt that next week against Miami of Ohio especially the offensive line I thought was bullying people like that. I saw the creative run plays. Sometimes you'd pull Jakari out and he would be in the second level putting a linebacker in the dirt. So what changed in the locker room from Buffalo to Miami? You know what? I can't put my finger on it. I, I, I don't because um, um, I thought the Buffalo week was our best prep week. I was out of my mind uh, all week long. And um, I thought we would come out and play our best football game. And I was disappointed that we didn't. And um, I made it quite clear to our team that I was very disappointed. And, uh, you know, we got character guys and they, they realized that, uh, that we didn't come out with the intensity that we needed to. And uh, then we were able to, uh, to have intensity and make a little run 
uh, those those next couple ball games. So um, I thought again we had a good game plan against uh, Miami. Uh, looking back at the Buffalo game, um, you know we turned the ball over constantly. It was one of our worst games in terms of turnover, uh, uh, having turnovers. And uh, we just couldn't make a play. We couldn't get any momentum and, and get out of our funk. And uh, that's what happened. But uh, we made some plays in the Miami of Ohio game early, got some momentum going, and found a way to win the game. Yeah, and I thought the the run game really took a step forward against Miami and uh, against Central Michigan, too, the following week. I think both those weeks, Jason went over 100 yards. The offensive line was starting to actually mash people and really establish a front. Uh, so where did that flip switch? Because the offensive line was a little – actually, Coach, can I end this and then just email you another invite right mid season where the line can start mashing people and really start establishing themselves in certain games. And also, um, there was some good consistency this year with most of the line. Obviously, once Jakari's uh, waiver got sent through. Um, but you made the decision to keep swapping the left tackles, Tunde and Cam Stewart, kind of in and out. Was that game plan just like both were playing so well, maybe confused the defense? What went into switching them, and how did the offensive line take so many strides in the middle of the season? Yeah, I think the getting Jakari eligible was the whole key. And uh, we knew that uh, that he would uh, really solidify the middle of, of, of our offensive line, you know, between him and Grant. Uh, we just felt that uh, he was the key. So – to answer your question, I think they finally got uh, – we got the five guys in there that we wanted to play, and they started getting the, a feel for each other and started playing together. And because uh, we didn't really – there wasn't very many ads in terms of, you know, new scheme in the run game, but I just think those guys gelled finally and uh, played much better. There's no question about it. Your second question about the tackle between Cam and Tune Day is uh, – you know, both were guys that were transfers that uh, that, uh, you know, never got to have a spring football. The only the only time that they really got to play with uh, with our team was during uh, training camp. And uh, we weren't using uh, Tune Day, you know, and Cam as a game plan uh, decision. We weren't using them to try to confuse the defense. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, they weren't they weren't ready at all to play an entire game. And we had to spell them. And uh, that's what we did. So it had nothing to do with game plan. It had to do with um, being able to play a complete game. Right. And then so, you know, we're moving through the 2022 season. A lot of highs, a lot of lows. You know, the beat Marshall Buffalo game was kind of, of a debacle. Rattle off an impressive three-game win streak. And then you just got to take one of the final three to go bowling. It comes against Toledo, whose number you just kind of seem to have a little bit, unlike the coaches of the previous decade at Bowling Green. Um, and so that game, obviously, weeknight covered in snow. Um, one specific thing I actually want to ask about that game, when I think it was Jalen Embry returned a kickoff for a touchdown, there was they called a block in the back, which there wasn't, and then they called an unsportsmanlike for him diving into the end zone. Did you get a good explanation on – I've never seen that called ever. You know what? I didn't get an explanation. I uh, I got to Jalen instantly and, you know, gave him an earful just because why why put yourself in that position for, for an official to have the ability to flag you? Um, to make a long story short, you know, officials make bad calls. That's part of it, and we had to move on, but – I thought uh, the week of the Toledo game, we had a, you know, the, the year prior, they, they came down to our place and just kicked our ass inside and out. And I take 100% responsibility for that ass kicking that we had against Toledo at home. It was by far, and, and most of the time I can walk out and go, okay, we had a good plan here. Uh, we had one or two things that went wrong, but, you know, we had a solid plan. Our protection plan against Toledo, uh, my third year here, was absolutely horrific. We had a terrible pl protection plan uh, for a bunch of really good defensive linemen. And uh, after we got here, uh, I thought our protection plan was outstanding. I thought uh, 
they run some unique coverages. I think our our plan overall offensively uh, was excellent. I, I do. I mean, uh, I I think we we did some really good things in protecting the quarterback and uh, get him doubles on on guys that traditionally you wouldn't get double teams on. Uh, so I thought that was a – trust me, we learned our lesson, and I learned my lesson from that year three because that was that was embarrassing. I, I didn't give our guys a shot whatsoever, and uh, I just said it would never happen again. So um, if we're going to get beat, we're going to get beat because of uh, the other guys just better or someone slips and falls down or something that's out of our control. But uh, that year three against Toledo was – that protection plan sucked. And, right. um, and this year it was pretty damn good. Yeah. I mean, it was a heck of a game, obviously when they scored, uh, it was definitely, you know, I guess looking back on obviously the right decision to let them in the offense, unbelievably just moves down the field scores. Obviously, you know, Matt played well, the line was holding up that final drive. Um, so you get that huge win, which obviously, Keep the driver trophy here. Uh, you're two and two against Toledo. The season ends up with the bowl loss. Uh, you've talked about how invaluable that time, extra time with the team is, being able to prep for bowls, practice longer, keep everyone in the facility. Uh, is that kind of why you were the first team to do spring ball this year? Just coming off, you know, we got all this time with the bowl win. Let's just keep it going. No, the the rationale of of why we did spring football early. Uh... You know, I think it in in the next couple of years we're going to see a total different calendar uh, than what we've ever seen in college football. And the reason that we did spring ball so early was one, we had a a ton of injuries and a ton of surgeries that those guys weren't going to play spring football anyway. Um, the second rationale was we we lost so much, so many returning starters from the portal. Um, right after the bowl game that we wanted to identify the guys that we brought in from the portal in January. And we wanted to see exactly what we have and what we don't have. And um, so what we were able to do is establish and, and be able to go, okay, we, we, we feel good at this position. We feel good at this position. These are the three positions that we need to get guys in the transfer portal in the next free agent market here in April. And uh, the third reason is that um, with this new new group of guys that we brought in, uh, we wanted six to seven straight weeks of, of training, of lifting weights and getting big and strong. Uh, that was the other reason. And then the last reason, uh, we can't afford to get anyone hurt and lose anyone for training camp. So if you, if you got a guy hurt in February during spring football, you know, if a kid did a labrum, you're going to have him back for training camp. So um, there was a lot of thought process of why we went early opposed to late. So um, I think it was the right decision. Actually, I know it was the right decision. We've got a great understanding of what we need to to get in the transfer portal. Um, the guys that we were knock on wood, there was no one that got majorly hurt during spring. So we're going to have all our guys that participated in spring back. Uh, the guys that were all injured from the season, uh, barring one, they'll all be back for training camp except one. And uh, we've just uh, got way ahead of the portal in terms of we know what we need to go get. We know uh, what has to be done. And it's going to be pivotal, in my opinion. What happens between April 15th and June 1 of getting our roster solidified is going to be absolutely imperative. We we lost so many guys uh, that were returning, you know, from the transfer portal and after the bowl game that we need to replace those guys and shore up our holes. And then June is, uh, you know, you're building your football team. And the, the good thing about, you know, our coaches is, you know, we can adapt and adjust to a lot on both sides of the ball with personnel. You know, if we have to go play like we did at Florida, we can go play like we did at Florida. If we need to, be an under center team like we were at Michigan, we can do that. If we need to go and be what we were last year, we can do that. We've got, you know, we've ran so many different types of offenses that we can adapt and adjust to to what we get and don't get in the portal. So, uh, but 
in my opinion, um, we need to finish up these next couple weeks of, uh, of weightlifting. And it is going to be absolutely uh, imperative that we do really well in uh, this next set of uh, free agency. Right. And I don't want to, you know, take up too much of your time today, but one of the things I did want to dive into a little bit is the portal. Obviously it's like a, you know, you sign up for a job and the job description changes a year in because the portal, you know, kept the free agency market. We're not even talking about that in 2018. It was an afterthought. It didn't even exist. Um, and so, you know, the Dave Clawson model of, you know, we'll recruit this class, we'll build them up, they'll be in our weight room for three years, and then they'll be mashing people on the line or beating people on the outside. That's kind of gone because you don't see that same retention. Um, and I know it's kind of tough as a coach because, you know, there's a lot of obviously strain on the staff when it comes to recruiting. But as, you know, a simple fan who doesn't know much about anything when it comes to coaching, Am I crazy for thinking that the portal is more advantageous to a school like Bowling Green that can look at a guy? I mean, if you look at this particular class, you know, you bring in a guy like Connor, quarterback, obviously big name, everyone knows, you know, tossed for a million yards against LSU in 2020, SEC freshman of the year. And so you obviously it stinks to lose a guy like Broden and Anderson and others to those schools. But when you bring in someone like Bazelak, who you never would have had a snowball's chance of recruiting out of high school, does it sort of even out if not like, you know, even a guy like Bronson Warner, who wasn't even much of a starter at Abilene Christian, you bring him in, he starts every game at right guard. I, am I crazy for thinking that the portal has become a, a plus value something for Bowling Green? I think it's, it's bittersweet. I think then there's some scenarios that you take a guy like Broden, for example, Broden, had zero scholarship offers to anyone in our conference and he was 170 pounds and you worked your tail off to develop him. And he probably would have had his best year of football this coming year. He, hands down. I know he would have, uh, but you know, you developed him and he was good enough to go play in the sec. So God bless him. Uh, that's the part that's frustrating as a coach. Uh, am I, Am I negative towards Bro? No, he got an unbelievable opportunity to go play in the SEC. I mean, of course. I mean, that's a, you know, I, I want to see all our guys and coaches, you know, be extremely successful in their careers. And he felt that this was an opportunity to go play at the at the highest level. And um, so that's frustrating. That part's frustrating. But uh, I wish that, uh, you know, and go back to our first year that, you know, I was the biggest uh, proponent of of getting rid of the uh, the 25 initials. I wanted those 25 initials to to be gone like no other. And our first time that we ever had 85 on scholarship was this year, was year four. And uh, I think there's some advantage of not having, you know, if you if you're a coach that walked in and, and you had 56 guys leave the program like we did, I think the portal and the the ability, most importantly, to be able to sign as many guys as you need to sign up to 85, that can really change your program really quickly. And the reason that we knew that it was going to be a long haul here is we were not in that position whatsoever. We had to take 25 high school kids right. and we knew the formula. So um, I think there's, there's opportunities like we got OJ, for example. Yeah. Um, there's, there's times that this is really going to help our program. And there are times it's going to be very frustrating for fans. It's going to be very frustrating for coaches because you're going to recruit uh, a very good high school pro, uh, kid. He's going to play very well here. And the next thing you know, he's not on your team. So I think, uh, um, I think in certain situations, it's going to be frustrating to all of us. And then in other situations, it's going to be advantageous to us, you know, that we're able to fill a hole so quickly. So, um, the whole key, in my opinion, though, is you still have to have some foundation with high school kids. You can't go all portal. Um, you'll 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 kill your culture. So you still got to, you know, do it the old way and bring in some high school kids to establish the bowling ring culture. And then you have to use this transfer portal to fill your holes. And, um, you know, the nerve wracking thing about it is, you know, if, if the if those guys would have returned last year, I would look at you right now and I would go, we're going to walk to the dance this this coming deal. I would have. I mean, and yeah. I wouldn't have hesitated. 
I wouldn't have hesitated. I wouldn't have very similar to, to, to how I said the formula was going to go. I would go, we're going to go win the championship. No ifs, ands, or buts. Do I still think we can do that? Absolutely. But the nerve wracking piece of this is in the old way, you looked at it and you went, okay, very similar. We're, we're old. We've got guys returning. We're going to, we're going to have a hell of a team. And now you're going, you're not going to do that until the end of June, <laughs> you know, yeah. because you're, you're not having your, you're going to have 14 or 12 to 16 new guys in your program. And you're not really going to know who you actually are until the end of June. So um, it's just a different world. The business model has been flipped twice. You know, you walk into a total rebuild, COVID hits, you walk in and then all of a sudden there's a, there's a thing called the transfer portal and NIL, you know, it's just a, it's a total different, uh, total different uh, uh, business model than what we walked into year one. That's for sure. Right. And I think that's totally the right way to go about it. It's somewhere in the middle, like with most things in life, you're going to lose guys like Broden and Anderson, which suck, but you have a guy like OJ, you know, tear it up. You have an Austin Osborne, um, is he going to apply for a medical retro? Do you have any information on that with this last year? I don't know that. Um, I'm just glad that we have him back this year. I mean, yeah. we, we, you know, that kid, I, I feel really bad for that kid. That kid had a fluke, fluke uh, deal happen in training camp. Like literally him and Jordan Anderson collided in Skelly. And it was Jordan was not even trying to make contact with them. They just ran into each other. And I, I literally, when it happened, I thought, oh, this is no big deal. And his, his injury was, was as bad as it gets. And, you know, he fought his tail off to come back and, uh, and try to play. And in all actuality, looking back, you know, we shouldn't have played him at all this year. You know, at the end, we just shouldn't have and uh, let him get healthy. But he's healthy now and he's going to help our team. I'm very excited for him. He's a great kid. Yeah. Um, and also speaking to development, um, obviously one of the big names coming out of the program, Carl Brooks, every mock draft has him going. Um, so two points, one, how, you know, does it make you feel as a coach seeing where you came in and you talked about it with guys like Carl Brooks, guys like Walt Hare, where you were like, these guys aren't going to make it. And then you come out of here four years later and Carl's on every draft board. Um, so can you talk about his development and then also, what it can mean recruiting or to the program that has not had a lot of draft picks come out recently. Well, first off, you know, where you, where we feel pretty good as a staff, whenever we first got here, no one was at pro day and I'm talking nobody. I mean, there was a handful of scouts. And then this year, all, all, every single NFL team was represented. It was awesome. And uh, they weren't just here to see Carl. They were here to see our other guys, you know, that could possibly be free agents. So as a coach, you knew that you did a good job recruiting and changing because of just the, of the amount of NFL scouts that are coming to look at your guys. Two, um, you know, going back to the transfer portal, you did something right if, if 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 big schools like the big schools came in and took our guys you know obviously we did a good job of developing because the majority of those guys had zero scholarship offers out of high school we took a chance on them we developed them and uh we were off you know we developed them and they and they and they left but going back to carl carl really um paints the entire picture of where we've come. Carl Brooks, if you would have told me four years ago when I met Carl Brooks that he would be a draft pick, that he would be a captain, that he would graduate, I would have laughed at you. He had a terrible attitude. He was lazy. He didn't buy into anything. He was terrible in the classroom. And he bought into exactly what we're promoting. And he bought into it in a big way. And I've had 15 NFL teams call me and I, I go, I would take Carl Brooks right now. He's got a great attitude. He's a captain. He's a leader. He went from a terrible student to a very good student. He's awesome in the weight room. He's awesome with the younger guys. 
this guy is going to make it. And, uh, but if you had asked me that four years ago, no way. So in, in all actuality, I think Carl's story is a microcosm of where we've come from. I mean, it was God awful. I mean, and, and when I mean God awful, it was awful. And to be able to watch a guy that was not good in any facet, I mean, zero facet, um, change buy into the program and be a hell of a player, a hell of a student, a hell of a leader. Um, great with the young guys. Um, you know, that's, that's why we're in this to watch guys go from, um, literally low man on the totem pole to you, you, you never thought he would make it or be here to be quite honest with you. And I thought Carl Brooks would not be a guy that we would have, uh, end up having four years from now, you know, and, uh, he's awesome. I love him. I mean, I love him. And, uh, I'm so damn proud of that guy. And Walt Hare, same, same animal. He's not going to get drafted, but Walt was the same exact guy as Carl. Not a good practice player, lazy, this, that, this, that. Walt Hare was an awesome leader, awesome and a football player. So it's been fun to watch the guys that stayed in the program, you know, change their lives, be better students, be great off the field, be gracious, be humble and change and put themselves in position to either play in the National Football League or be able to go out in society now and kick ass in the real world. So it's been fun to watch the change. Now, what we got to do is we got to take the next step. We've got to go and uh, find a way to from being competitive to, to moving ourselves into competing for championships. And that's hard to do. You know, I, I said it to these guys uh, yesterday ago, going from God awful to competitive, believe it or not, isn't that hard. It's going to take time and it did take time, but it's not hard being able to now go from competitive to, to a championship level, those standards and expectations and those daily habits have got to be absolutely elite on a daily basis. And it's hard to be elite on a daily basis. It's hard. That's why, that's why there's only 2% of, uh, of, 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 of alphas. That's uh, honestly, because they can be consistent on a daily basis. So, um, we're, uh, we're moving in the right direction, and uh, I appreciate everything that you've done for us, and uh, we're just going to keep keep plugging along, okay? Thanks, Coach. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. Um, obviously, like I said, you followed your own blueprint perfectly. You laid it out. You guys have literally done everything you said, so I want to really just commend you and the staff for that, commend the players. Obviously, it was a big step forward this year, a really monumental, really fun season to watch, and I – can't wait till we're hopefully zooming and you got a championship ring to show me for the Mac. Um, I really well, fully I'll, believe I'll, I'll, I'll send you one too. How about that? So <laughs> that, that'd be perfect. That'd be perfect. Not that I do anything. Uh, coach, before I let you go, one question, last question. Do you have a favorite restaurant in BG? Oh my gosh. I like to eat. So uh, there's, there's a lot, I've got a lot, you know, I, I love, I love this town and uh, just like urban and, uh, and Clawson said to me, you know, I've, I've been to some great places. I mean, awesome football schools, awesome academic institutions. And this is one of my favorite places that I've ever worked that we had to get through. The people are unbelievable. The school is awesome. There's tradition here. It's a great college campus. Um, my family loves it. And obviously my wife being an alum uh, and my son going to school here, you know, I owe Bowling Green I wake up every single morning and I, and I, and I say to myself, I am going to bust my butt like no other. I'm going to outwork everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm here 18, 20, 22 hours. It doesn't matter because Bowling Green deserves uh, a person that cares. And, uh, you know, we've got a staff and a bunch of players that care now. And uh, this is a special place and it's our job to, uh, to get us back to that next step. And we appreciate it, Coach. I mean, you, your love for the school and your dedication, all the long hours. Um, I, just as a fan and an alum, really, really appreciate it. And so I'll let you go.